Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Now in today's episode we're going to be taking yet another look at the wonderful Apple TV first generation. And as suggested by a few of you guys in the comment section on the last video I did on this thing where we installed Mac OS X Leopard on it, which it is still running, don't let the desktop wallpaper confuse you, this is Mac OS 10.5.8. But today, we're going to be taking it to the next level because we're going to be installing Windows XP on this thing, that's right, and we're going to be using Apple's wonderful we're going to be using Apple's bootcamp software to accomplish this and dual boot the Apple TV with OS X and Windows XP. But first, I gotta thank today's video sponsor Linode for making this episode possible, but also first, one of the things I realized about this modified version of OS 10.5, if you remember from the last video I mentioned that the people who released this disk image online had modified it a little bit. They removed some unnecessary components to free up the Apple TV's system resources and also allow the installation to take up a little bit less space on the hard drive. And one of those things just so happened to be Boot Camp Assistant. So if we go into the Finder here and go into Applications and go into Utilities, you'll see that Boot Camp Assistant is nowhere to be found. I did a search to see if it was moved to another location on the hard drive, and well, it wasn't. It's just not on here at all. So that leaves us with pretty much two options. I could either take the hard drive out of this Apple TV again and write another OS 10.5 image to it that hopefully includes Boot Camp, or we can do what I'm gonna try to do today, and that is using a beta version of Boot Camp Assistant. Now, a little history about Boot Camp. The feature was officially introduced in OS 10 as a pre-installed feature with OS 10 Leopard, but that was version 2.0. All of the version 1X releases were technically betas, and they were made available by Apple on their website as a separate download for people who wanted to try it out, and it could run under OS X Tiger. The initial version was released in April of 2006, so that's a little over a year prior to Leopard's launch. And on this USB drive, I've got two beta versions that we're going to try and uh, see if, you know, one of them works. I've got a powered USB hub, if I can reach for it here, plugged into the Apple TV because there's only one USB port on the back and we're going to plug in that USB flash drive and you see we've got two versions. I believe this right here is version 1.0 but we're going to copy version 1.4 over to the desktop because this is actually the last beta version. After this according to Wikipedia at least came version 2.0. So this version was released in August of 2007 so just a couple months before the launch of OS 10 leopard and we're going to just double click it here mount the dmg and hopefully uh we'll be able to install this without <laughs> any issues uh it was never i don't think this was really ever intended to be used on os 10 leopard of course it didn't exist at the time so let's have it verify the dmg there we could skip it but it's almost done so we're not going to bother with it and there we go hooray so Read before you install. Do you want to read it? Uh, let's skim through it at least. Okay, let's see what Apple's telling us about. Bootcamp Assistant Beta V1.4 is a preview software licensed for use on a trial basis for a limited time. Do not use Bootcamp or other Bootcamp Beta software in a commercial operating environment or with important data. So it tells you what's new. Significant bug fixes have been made to the following technologies. Bootcamp Control Panel, Keyboard Support, yada, yada, yada. Let's just get out of the RTF and go back to... Bootcamp assistant here. I guess I closed the window and we'll run the MPKG to install it. Oh, this is the same RTF file. Great. Okay. We'll do continue. Yes, continue. Yes, agree. Take 343 megabytes of hard drive space on the computer. That's just fine. Oh, yeah. What was my password? I think it was MJD. Oh my gosh, what was my password? Was it, oh, it was nothing. Okay, I was like kind of concerned there for a second. I usually make the password for stuff in these videos MJD, but I just made it blank when I was going through the setup process. So that's all good. One other thing worth mentioning is of course, the Apple TV does not have any 
optical disk drive because you know it doesn't really need to have one so we have an external drive right here that we're going to put the windows xp professional installation disk into install succeeded hooray so we're going to close out of that we're going to get out of this window we'll just i'm going to drag the image down here because i'm so used to the dock being on the bottom of the screen but i did move it over to the left side just for really no reason just because i thought it was nice but okay uh let's go <laughs> let's go back to finder here and we go into applications now does it install to the applications folder or the utilities folder it might be under utilities that would be my guess at least let's see oh there it is boot camp assistant hooray so we're going to open that up all right so there's a time bomb on here let's go back in time to 2006 and let's just make this when was this released august let's just do august 23rd 2006 we'll save that no it's not supported you need 2.0 oh my gosh no Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? I thought it was gonna launch. Okay, good news, I think there might be a way around this, and that involves just changing the version number that OS X reports to applications when they are launched. So we have to disable system integrity protection, it looks like, which is done through a simple terminal command. So let's just open up terminal here. Oh, it was introduced in El Capitan. Okay, that makes sense. So we don't even have to bother with that. So, we have to run a sudo nano system library service. Is it services or course? It's core services. System version dot plist. Got to enter our password, which is nothing. What was that about? Oh, you know what? It's probably because we don't have. Yeah, it's probably <laughs> because we don't have a password. It like we're entering nothing and it's just quitting because we haven't typed in a password even though there is no password so let me assign a password to this user account there we go okay so uh let's see navigate to the end of the version number under product user visible version okay there we go so we're going to change that to 10.4.11 save yes file name right Okay, so we should, if we go to about this Mac, it should actually report, yeah, 10.4.11. So, but see, the thing is, I wonder if it goes by the build, because if it checks the build string, it's going to know that this is not a 10.4 build. So let's just try to log out again and log back in. Come on, login screen, where are you at? It's taking a little longer this time. Uh... Is it like locked up or something? That's the second time the pinwheel displayed there. Oh, please don't tell me I just screwed it up by changing. I'm gonna have to unplug the Apple TV. We'll plug it back in because there's no power button on this thing. So <laughs> I wonder if I just screwed it up by changing the actual system version string and now it's like it just doesn't know what to do. I just have a feeling that changing that one line might have screwed something up. Okay, we got a cursor. So that's something at least. Cursor went away. Oh no. Oh, no. <laughs> that one thing. Th that has to be what it is. I don't know what else it could be. All of a sudden, it's like refusing to even display the login screen. Uh, and yeah, the cursor. It's like caught in a loop here. All right. I'm just going to have to unplug the power from the Apple TV again. And uh, <laughs> take the hard drive out. And we're going to write a different image of OS 10.5 to it. But you know what? I'm thinking of something here because I've got this physical copy of OS 10 Leopard that was donated to me by a viewer, by the way, from Canada. Thank you very much. And we've got the external drive here. So maybe we could just put in this disk, you know, just boot off of it, hold C at startup and see if we can boot off of this and install OS 10 Leopard. And this will be, you know, we know for sure it will be a standard copy because the disk images, there's only notes on this one that indicate that it's modified. It specifically says that they, they remove things like Spotlight and uh, like the ability to do a software update. But the other versions don't have any notes at all, but they could have been also modified and have stuff removed. So we could go through all this and still not have boot camp because boot camp I would think would be one of the first things to be cut because it's not necessary. Nobody in their right mind would ever want to use boot camp on an Apple TV first gen, except of course for me, because that's what we do on this channel. I have a feeling we're going to run into issues though with text files because running a full-fledged copy of OS 10 Leopard was never intended to be possible on an Apple TV first gen. So there are some text files that you have to, I believe, remove and you have to add some, maybe a little bit of both. Um, but you know what? Let's just try it. We got nothing to lose. So let me just uh, eject our, our disk drive here. We'll pop in 
our physical copy of Mac OS X Leopard. And let's see if we can even hold down C at startup to boot off of the CD. Nope, it's just booting right off the hard drive, not even going to the boot menu at all. One thing I just realized, are we even gonna be able to boot, how are we gonna boot off of the Windows XP CD? Cause there, there's no way we're gonna be able to do that. Because if we can't get it to boot off of the OS X CD, how are we gonna get it to boot off of the Windows XP CD? Is this not even possible? Yeah, this is not a, a really a great sign at all for what's to come, but I'm gonna try it anyway. I'm going to take out the, let me make sure I put this thing back in properly. I'm gonna take out the hard drive, go through that whole thing again, write another disk image to it, and we'll see if, if maybe this whole thing can work. But first, I'm going to take a little sanity break to talk a bit more about today's video sponsor, Linode. If this video has been giving you the urge to install Windows XP on something, why not do it on one of Linode's Linux-based virtual machines? Well, okay, you can do that, but there's far more practical things you can do instead, like hosting a website, or a game server, or a Plex media server, or even your own file storage solution with Nextcloud. But that really only scratches the surface of what you can do with them, because if it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. For just $5 per month, you can get started with a shared virtual machine with one gigabyte of RAM and 25 gigabytes of SSD storage. But as a thank you for watching this video, if you sign up for a new Linode account through my link in the video description, you'll get $100 worth of credit that you can spend over the course of 60 days. It's a great way to give Linode a test drive while also helping out the channel along the way. So be sure to check them out, and huge thanks again to Linode for making today's episode possible. Alright, welcome back. So, I went ahead and copied over the version one image that was in that bundle that I showed in the last video of there's like six different disk images in there. And yeah, I didn't even bother putting on the bottom part of the Apple TV because we might have to take the drive out here again. So we just got it like this flipped over and we're going to plug the power cable in and we got that same off-centered boot screen here. Uh, one thing I, I should mention as well, because I'm sure some people will comment about it and say, why didn't I just copy over Bootcamp 2.0? to the Apple TV here. Well, that's because I couldn't find a copy of the bootcamp installer.app version 2.0 file. I searched on the internet archive, I couldn't find it. I was again able to find these beta versions on there and I didn't have a, a Mac OS 10.5 machine easily accessible to me at least. Come on, bootcamp, bootcamp, bootcamp. Come on, let's go, let's go, bootcamp, please. It doesn't have it. Oh my gosh, are you kidding me? It's been removed from here too. Oh no. All right, so welcome back once again. It's been a little while since the last clip and there's a good reason for that because I have been going down a bit of a research rabbit hole to try and get to the bottom of this. And as it turns out, we've pretty much been wasting our time with this whole boot camp thing because boot camp is impossible to use on the Apple TV first generation. And that has to do with the firmware that the Apple TV first generation has. Now I discovered this while browsing a couple of form threads back from 2007, this one here on Insanely Mac is from March of 2007, where surprisingly somebody was talking about installing Windows XP on an Apple TV. And somebody mentions down here that Boot Camp would not be possible because the part of bootcamp which does all of the work is actually a BIOS compatibility support module in the firmware. So this is because since 2006, Apple computers that utilize Intel processors use an EFI firmware instead of the traditional BIOS. Now the Apple TV first gen never got this firmware update because there would be no reason for Apple to develop and release it because nobody's gonna be using an Apple TV to run full-fledged OS X and then dual boot it with Windows via bootcamp. So that means that the Apple TV is not even able to recognize a BIOS bootable disk like a Windows XP installation CD, for example, which we would have to boot into to go through the installation process. So what can we do? Well, I have a potential solution in mind. I don't know if it's going to work, but it sounds very promising. And that's using a combination of two utilities. One of them is Refit, which is an EFI boot manager 
for Intel Macs and other EFI based systems. Now, Refit itself is not in development anymore. The last version came out sometime in 2010, but there has been a fork of it released that is still updated to this day. But Refit will work just fine for us because, you know, it's it's closer to the Apple TV's release date. And even if the latest version doesn't work, we should be able to download an older version from 2007 or 2008 and use that instead. I've already got this copied over to the Apple TV's internal hard drive that we're going to install in a moment here and see if it works. Again, I don't know if it will. Now, the Apple TV first gen's firmware is very interesting because it doesn't, at least in my testing, support booting from external USB devices. You can only boot from the internal hard drive. Now you saw this earlier on in the video when I tried to boot from that OS X Leopard installation disk. I put it into the external DVD drive, which is recognized when you're booted into OS X, it shows up in OS X just fine, same with the USB flash drive. But I tried to hold down the C key while it was booting up, and the disk drive was spinning up, it was getting enough power, it was plugged into the USB hub, everything was great but it just booted straight from the hard drive. And I tried this a few times with the same result. I even tried holding down the option key, which normally on a regular Intel-based Mac would bring up the boot menu where you can select from all the different sources and all the different partitions you have available to you on your system. And even if there's only one, it'll still show up and you'll have to press enter on it to boot from that partition. And that didn't do anything either on the Apple TV. It just went straight to booting from the hard drive. So then I tried taking the hard drive out and doing the same thing trying to boot from the cd and holding down the option key and both times i got this screen which is not your traditional can't find a partition to boot from screen this is a, a modified one with the apple tv on it so this is definitely not the same firmware that you have in a traditional intel based mac so that's why i don't know if this is even going to work if it's going to even be able to to give us this boot menu when we install refit but we're going to try it anyways and if we can get that boot menu and see the mac os 10 leopard cd as a bootable device then that will be really useful for the next step which is going to be utilizing a piece of software called exom or zom XOM, whatever you wanna say, it's short for XP on Mac. And this is really interesting because XP on Mac was one of the earliest, if not the earliest attempt to get Windows XP running on Intel Macs before Apple officially supported it. In pretty much every other scenario, this would be rendered completely obsolete by Boot Camp. But again, the Apple TV lacks the firmware update with the BIOS compatibility module. So if we can get this to work, we should be able to install XP on the Apple TV. And luckily for us, the Internet Archive has archived this website and the download link. So I can click on this and actually download the zip file that contains everything that we need. They also released the source code, I believe shortly after uh, Apple released the bootcamp. So there it is right there. I've already got it downloaded. So it shows up as XOM1 in my uh, downloads list there. But but yeah, so we're going to use both of these tools to try and get this working. Now, one other thing worth mentioning, there is a patch for Windows XP that allows it to boot on an EFI system. Uh, it's here on the Internet Archive. There's been a few videos made about it, but this is really more of a proof of concept because it's pretty buggy from what I've seen in these videos, and it's pretty much a, a post install patch to where you have to already have a copy of windows xp installed and then make modifications to the files on the root of the c drive and then you'll be able to take that drive put it into another system that's efi and theoretically be able to boot from it. Every video I've seen on this thing, they do it in, in, in virtual machines where they just go in and change the you know hardware type from BIOS to UEFI and once they're done modifying the files. And it does work, but there's no guarantee it'll work on the Apple TV because I could go through and you know take the Apple TV's hard drive, install XP on it on another system, and then copy the UEFI patch files to the root of the drive, put it back in the Apple TV. It might not even boot from it. But again, this is our last resort. So we're going to, before we install Refit, since we're already here at the Capture PC, we're going to go through the process of creating a modified Windows XP boot disk that has all of these necessary files on it from WinXP on Mac. So if we go into the folder here that I've downloaded, 
Uh, this is everything that we need. We've got the, the patch file right here, or the patch folder rather, which has all the files we just got to copy over to the disk. And then we also have uh, this boot.img that we have to specify as the boot image. And then we have this EFI file right here, which we have to copy over to the Mac and boot into, we have to boot off of the OS 10 setup disk. That's why if this thing with refit doesn't even work and we can't even boot off the OS 10 setup disk, we can't do any of this because you have to boot off of that, repartition the drive and open up terminal, run a few terminal commands and copy this file over to the hard drive. So they have provided, and this will really age this here, uh, they have provided an NRB file, which is a Nero file. So I've got Nero burning ROM 6 on here. And um, oh yeah, we have to just open up Nero because it, it loves to close out of it when you double click on this file immediately. It says refresh complete and then it just closes. So we got to open up Nero here. So the first thing we have to do, let's just open up the readme here because we can go along with this uh, pretty easily. They have taken the time to write out a very detailed readme that goes step by step. And they have two separate guides. They've got quick instructions for those that know what they're doing, which is just kind of a, a very streamlined version. It just tells you, you know, unzip the file, you know, open this up in Nero, add the source files, overlay the XOM file, set the bootloading image. But if you didn't know what any of that meant, then you could go by this step-by-step -step guide, which just takes you through how to unzip, how to copy, how to open the file, how to add the source files to the project. And then down here, the second part is the installation, which is where I mentioned we got to have the uh, OS 10 CD and boot from that. And, uh, you know, again, they've got a little quick instructions for those that know what they're doing and a step by step instruction thing here, which is 14 steps or 13 if you want to not count done at the bottom. So we are going to let's just scroll back up here so I can skim through the quick instructions here. So we've got to unzip the file, which we've done use the included sp2.nrb Nero project as a baseline we've got that open add the xp source files to the root of the project now i've got an xp iso right here it specifically asks for an xp service pack 2 iso so i've got this here we can just open this up in windows explorer and then we'll just make a new folder on the desktop and we'll just call this uh, xpcd and we'll just copy everything over to that. All right, so we've got all those files copied over. So let's open this up and we'll just go here. We'll drag all these files to the root of the image file. And then we need to get out of this, go back to our other folder here and go into patch copy these two and oh, we don't want to replace it. Yeah, see, we just got to add these files into here we don't want to overwrite the entire folder so we are going to replace these individual files though so we'll say yes we'll just do replace all and there we go so those files have been replaced so we'll go back here go into oem so let's go back here oem so that's done and now select the bootloading image to the included boot.img so we do that i believe by just going to we got to go to burn here and then it'll come up we go to boot boot.img there it is open it doesn't say anything about these expert settings i don't know what version of nero they were using when they created this guide i don't know if we like do we really want to boot let's just uncheck this uh and iso that all looks fine label that's fine okay so let me uh let me just put a disk in the drive here and there it goes we're off to the races all right so we've got our image burned to the cd here and on the apple tv i've got version 0.14 of refit copied over so we're just going to mount the dmg and as I had mentioned before, you see here's the Mac OS install DVD I've got put into the external drive here. So it shows up just fine when we're booted into Mac OS. But let's get out of this and we're going to run the MPKG to install this. There's also this partition inspector tool that it comes with as well. So we'll just hit continue, put in our password. Hooray, install succeeded. So I believe what this does, if we go to system preferences, I think it makes a separate partition that will show up in the startup disk here. Maybe not. Because it mentioned something about if we go to the readme. Yeah, to get rid of refit, open up the startup disk preference panel and select Mac OS X as the operating system to boot. So it's supposed to show a separate partition in here. You see we only have the hard drive and the installed disk right now. So 
We're just going to get out of that. Well, there's the partition inspector. So it shows two partitions. Partition at LBA40, file system FAT32, listed in GPT is partition one type EFI system FAT. And then this is the HFS plus volume, which contains Mac OS X. So, I mean, I don't know if we just restart. Let me go back and look at the readme here. And we've got this EFI folder. We've got the refit blesser currently only available online okay no it just says for the automatic installation with the installer package which is what we just did it says you just install it and if everything went well you should see the refit boot menu on next restart so there is a way to manually install it which you might have to try if this doesn't work but let's just restart this and hope for the best i i'm very very skeptical we are going to just eject this DMG here. Let's just do it. Let's just restart and see what happens. This is the moment of truth because if we can't get this to work, then there's no point of even going through the XP on Mac stuff because we have to boot off of the Leopard disk for that to even be possible. How much you want to bet it's just going to boot from the OS 10 partition on the drive? Yep, it's just booting off. The <laughs> just booting off the OS 10 partition. Well, that was rather anticlimactic. Uh, so we can try the manual installation. Let's go back to system preferences here because I wonder if it even shows up as an option under startup disk. My guess is no, it doesn't. Yep, just got the OS 10 partition and the drive here. Now I wonder, okay, here's something that I didn't try. Could we select this and hit restart to boot off the CD? Because if we can boot off the CD, then we should be able to go through the rest of the XOM setup. But I just hit restart and it looks like it didn't do anything. Because we're still here. <laughs> so yeah, that's not a good sign either. Well, let's deauthenticate maybe. And we'll go to restart up here. And now we've selected the disc, you know, the CD or the DVD as the startup disc, but I don't think it's going to boot from that. We got the Apple logo, but I don't know if it's a CD or the hard drive yet. Nope, I can see the docs starting to load. It booted off the hard drive again. We can try to go through the manual installation for refits. And I want to see if we go into Finder here, if it even copy these files because it's supposed to copy stuff to the root level of the OS 10 volume. So if we go, go to folder, go to root, Apple TV HD. Yeah, there it is, EFI. And we've got refit in here. So all that's copied over. Though I wonder if because it says you have to run a terminal command, which I didn't see it do during the automated install. So let me open up terminal here. I was going to open up spotlight, but, uh, oh wait, we have, oh yeah, we've got spotlight in this version because, uh, this is the, the V1 image for 1058. So it has spotlight. Hooray. One thing I'm going to do is show hidden file. So that's defaults, right? Com dot apple dot finder apple show all files true and, uh, kill all finder and there we go i had way too many people by the way in the last video i did on installing os 10 on this thing when i ran that command on my macbook pro i got a bunch of people saying you can just press this keyboard shortcut to show halfa you can't do that on i was running mac os 10 el capitan so you, that that wasn't a thing <laughs> so way too many people commented that like it, it doesn't work trust me uh okay so if we go back into finder here and we'll go to go Go to folder, go to Apple TV HD, EFI. So what is the name of the, it is uh, refit enable.sh or it's in the refit folder. So it's this sh file here. So let's just drag that into terminal and run that. Enter our password. Okay, and now it just created a file. So that's good. So maybe it didn't run this. What is enable always.sh? I'm trying to see what that is on here. I don't, I wonder if there's more documentation or something. Let me go back here. Uh, 
readme does it mention that at all like do we have to run that if we want it to be enabled every single time it just says refer to the doc here which is what i've got pulled up on my phone and it doesn't make any mention of that it just says run enable.sh when prompt enter the password if everything went well you'll see the refit boot menu on the next restart if you get a message saying no switch file or directory in the last step and you didn't put the efi folder in the right place the manual installation method has a drawback that you should be aware of. Since you're not using Refit Blesser, Mac OS X updates will disable Refit and the Refit menu from showing up. And the Refit menu will show up even when waking from safe sleep. Okay. Yeah, that's the, the Refit Blesser tool, which I'm guessing it, it did all of that by itself. That's in here, tools, or maybe it's not. It's on the uh, DMG. I don't know. Let's just try to restart. We're going to just do it from the terminal here. Oh, that's interesting. So I'm guessing that it worked in the sense that it tried to boot from it, you know, instead of the OS X partition. But this is the same thing we got before when I took the hard drive out. So that's that's rather interesting. Yeah, there it is. Refit. So we select that. There it is. There's the boot menu. So it works. We did it properly. It's just that it doesn't boot up properly on the Apple TV. So that definitely has to do with the Apple TV's firmware. Now, this is interesting, though. What is this legacy OS from Apple TV HD? And it shows the Boot Camp logo there, which is interesting. I wonder what that is. Let's try. What is this? Okay, we got a DOS prompt. Because there was that other partition on, on the drive. Remember when we ran that partition tool? There was the main Mac OS X one, then there was that other partition that was like 40 megabytes or, or whatever, and it was a FAT or FAT32 file system. So I, I guess that had has to do with refit. I don't know, though. That's rather interesting, but it doesn't look like it's anything. But yeah, there you have it. So that works out just fine. It's just that we, we can't even boot into that partition on the Apple TV. And I would suspect the same thing is going to happen if I try to install XP on this thing and do the EFI patch. But I think we're going to try that anyway. All right, so not only do we have Windows XP installed, I've also upgraded this to Service Pack 3 because that's what the videos that I watched on this patch were utilizing. They had XPSP3 installed. And I believe these files were sourced from a Longhorn build or something. But yeah, basically, we just have to copy these over to the root of the C drive. And well, not all to the root of the C drive. There's one that goes in System32. But yeah, it's interesting because there were certain builds of Longhorn that utilized EFI to where you could load it on an EFI system and it was later dropped from Windows Vista when it was finally released they decided not to include that functionality it was reintroduced with Windows 8 though but I find it interesting that they were experimenting with it with Longhorn but yeah so I've got a note or rather a text edit document opened up on my MacBook Pro here with all the locations of everything that we got a you know, copy everything over to. So first thing we're going to do is go to folder options and we're going to show hidden files and folders and we're going to uncheck hide protected operating system files and we'll hit OK. And so on the root of the C drive, we have to make a folder called EFI. So we'll do new folder and call it EFI. Inside of there, we have to make a folder called boot. And inside of this, we have to copy, I think it's just right, yeah, this here. We have to copy this file over to there, and we have to rename it bootia32.efi. So we'll try that, bootia32.efi. So there it is. Then we're going to go back to the root of the C drive, go into Windows, and system32. Then we got to move winload.efi over to system32. So there we go. And then we have to find boot.ini. So we got to add no bcd underneath the timeout string there. And then at the very end of, I believe it's the last string, let's just get over here, we have to add 
slash use new loader. So we'll just copy that. There we go. So that's taken care of. Got our modified boot.ini in there. And that is, according to the video anyway, all there is to it. So let's go ahead and take this drive out of here, plug it back into the Apple TV and just see what happens. I, like I said, I, I don't think this is going to work at all, but it's certainly worth a try. All right, so we're gonna grab our drive here and connect it back to the cable. There we go. So we'll just nicely, gently rest the drive there. And let's just plug this in. So we've got a display output, got that classic line right down the left side there. And I am just going to bet that this is going to result in that same screen that we saw before with the question mark with the Apple TV. So, yep, we got the question mark screen. All right, welcome back once again. So we're at an interesting point in this video because I don't really know where we're at in this video in terms of what's actually going to be included because I've got like over three hours of footage to go through and you know a lot of that's going to get cut there's a lot of just sitting and waiting for stuff and i do try to streamline things in the editing process so you guys don't have to sit through like three hours of attempt after attempt after attempt um but let me just kind of run through what we've done so far so that if you guys have skipped through this video or if i've cut certain things out that you'll get a full picture of what we've done so far so we initially tried to use boot camp use that beta version on Mac OS 10.5. That didn't work because it said the OS 10 version was too new and that you had to just run version 2.0, which of course we didn't have because it was removed from the image. Then I tried going by some guy on Reddit. He said, oh, hey, you can do this series of things to change the reported version number to the applications. But there were two strings in there. And one of them, when I changed that version string, it made it to where I couldn't even log into the system. It was just caught in a loop. When you would boot it up, it would just get caught in a loop and it wouldn't log in. So then I tried to put another leopard image on here and that didn't have boot camp either. And that's when I discovered that it's not even possible because the Apple TV doesn't have the firmware update that Apple provided when they released boot camp to allow you to even install Windows and boot from you know a BIOS bootable medium like a Windows CD. So then I discovered XP on Mac and I tried to go that route. And around this time, we discovered that I can't boot off of the OS 10 installation CD, which makes trying to use XOM or XP on Mac not possible in the Apple TV's current state anyways, because it seems like it can't boot from USB devices at all. I mean, it can't. I've tried a USB CD-ROM driver, or USB DVD-ROM driver rather, and a USB flash drive. You can't even hold down the option key to get to the boot manager. There might not even be a boot manager, you know, in the sense that you think of it, like on Mac OS or on Windows, where you can view all of your bootable sources. And that honestly might be the case. So with that in mind, I tried to use the Windows XP EFI patch on another system. I installed Windows XP, made the necessary modifications, put the drive back in here, and it wasn't able to find that at all. So not only can it not boot from any USB device, but it seems to only be able to boot from a Mac OS 10 properly formatted hard drive so i pretty much ended the video there and then i got an idea and that was what if i were to connect a dvd drive to this ide port this 44 pin ide connector right here on the motherboard or the logic board whatever you want to say and i was like yeah i should try that so i went ahead and ordered two uh 44 pin IDE to 40 pin IDE adapters because I don't have an IDE disk drive that has a 44 pin IDE connector. Now, I think these would work in both ways because these are both designed. I'll, I'll show you this one here. I got two just in case one of them didn't work, but I've got this one here, which is on a PCB and it actually says HDD changer gender. Uh, which I find it's like it's a gender changer not changer gender but okay so yeah these are designed 
to basically allow you to plug in like a 44 pin IDE drive like this to a computer like the 98 PC that I've got over here, which of course only has 40 pin IDE connectors on the motherboard. So that's why you've got the Molex connector there. But we're gonna try it in the reverse and that's why I have the 98 PC here because this has a DVD drive right here. And so we're going to try to connect its 40 pin IDE cable to the Apple TV and then put the OS 10 installation disc into the drive and see if it can boot from that when the drive is connected to this IDE connector. So let's go ahead and just try this one here, this Sabrent, Sabrent, connecting differently. So yeah, that's a fantastic slogan so we'll take that out of there and we're not even going to need the molex connector i'm just going to go ahead and take that off because i'm going to plug the 98 pc into the wall and just have the disk drive get power that way so all we're going to do is just plug the 44 pin female end into the male end on the motherboard here let me make sure i'm doing this the right way which I believe is, oh no. Yeah, this has all the pins. This one has one of the pins missing right here. So that's not going to work at all. And it's the same way on this one too. That was, pff. and you see this connector here, how it's got all the pins open. This is the end that goes into the motherboard, but the other end here has one of them missing. So this can only plug into the motherboard that way. But yeah, that was a major oversight on my part. I'm sure that, pff, it's done that way to prevent you from doing something like this because it's not intended to do this, I'm sure. All right, let's try this again. So I have just ordered the, whatever this is, it's an adapter. It's a high quality product. And it looks like there, you got some French down here. Uh, the company's from Germany. There's also a UK, oh, I guess like that's the company in the UK. I don't know, wherever it came from, I ordered it from Amazon. Well, it was made in China, of course, but, yeah, this is a 44-pin IDE uh, coupler, basically, if I can actually get the thing open here. There we go. Come on. Come on. So it's like one of these things. And my plan is to use, because if you look on here, both ends have that one pin missing, right? So there's one end, and here's the other one. So what we're going to do, come on, focus in. Come on. Show them the pins, come on, there you go, okay, beautiful. So, what I'm going to do, we're gonna take this cable and plug it into the motherboard. We're then going to take this and plug it into here, just like that, so there we go. And then into here, we're going to plug in this, which I sealed back up in case I had to return it, so let me just uh, get it back out of here. And we're gonna take off the Molex uh, part here, and then just plug this into here there we go look at that so now this can be plugged right onto the motherboard if i can line it up here and now we have a really janky 44 pin to 40 pin ide adapter now the whole plan here if i didn't already explain this is We've already confirmed that the Apple TV can recognize USB devices when it's booted up. So what I was going to do is see if we can boot off of the OS X Leopard CD, which I have to find here. There it is, I knew it was somewhere. So we're gonna boot off the CD, and then if we can do that, we're going to plug the internal hard drive into a USB adapter and plug that into the USB port on the Apple TV or into the powered USB hub, which would be plugged into the USB port on the Apple TV and then go through the XOM setup process. I don't think that there's a high chance of any of this working because I feel like this is a firmware thing, but we're gonna try it anyway because we have nothing to lose. All right, so just to simplify things a little bit, I went ahead and took the Molex power adapter from my IDE slash SATA to USB adapter, and I've got that plugged into the DVD drive so we don't have to power on the entire 98 PC. And so what we're gonna do is plug the Apple TV and that in at the same time, and then see if we can eject this drive before it begins to boot up. We can always just power it off with the disk in. I know I could just use a paper clip to manually eject it, but whatever, we're just gonna do it this way. So let's grab our, gosh, there's so many freaking cables up here. Let me uh, grab these and we'll plug them in. 
And there we go. We got power on the drive. We're going to eject that. We're going to pop in our OS 10 DVD and let's see if it recognizes that in time. Oh no. And we got the, the question mark. No, no. <sighs> All right. So yeah, th that's what I kind of thought was going to happen, but you know, let me try. Although I wonder, is this a dual layer DVD? It is. Oh my gosh. It's a dual layer DVD. Of course it is. Luckily, I have another DVD drive that is actually capable of reading dual layer DVDs. Only problem is it's a SATA drive because of course it is. So we have to get yet another piece of an adapter here. I don't know why I said piece of an adapter. We need another adapter here that I'm plugging the IDE, the 40 pin IDE and the Molex connector into, and then we're gonna plug that into the power, or the, the power, the, the power and data SATA connectors on the back. So, okay, let's just set this here. This is like, <laughs> we're going through like four adapters right now. This is utterly absurd. Uh, okay, so let's plug these back in. All right, drive comes on, let's eject it. Quickly put this in. And just for safe measure, I'm gonna unplug them again so that it turns on with the disc in the drive. No, 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 we got the same thing again. And we do have this other adapter. All right, well, this is interesting. I can't plug this in all the way. <laughs> I can get the pins down here to go in, but like somewhere along the way here, it's not going in like, and I don't want to put too much pressure on it, but it's like there's something caught in one of the holes or something. It does look like something's in there. That's not going to show up on camera very well, but one of these holes, it looks like there's a, there's a blockage. Also, what kind of soldering job is that? Look at this on here. Like I'm no pro solderer, but oh my gosh, freaking, it's almost as bad as the focus on this camera. Look at this pin right here. Like, look at all that excess solder. I wonder if like one of the, the balls of solder got into like one of the holes here to where it's just completely blocking this from going in. Because all it takes is one pin to be blocked for the entire thing not to be able to connect properly. So, all right, that's a, pff, that's a disaster. Can't even use that. Yeah, so I guess you can't use one of these adapters. Because again, these adapters, were made to do the reverse of what we're trying to do here. It's made so you can plug like this hard drive into this computer here. And that's where this comes into play because you would you would put this onto the end here and then you would connect a Molex connector to it. And then you would plug this ID cable into here and that way the drive gets the power that it needs, you know, the, the, the five volt power from here. Well, you know what? I think that about does it for this video. The only other thing that we can try to do, and I still don't think it's going to, let me just reach over here and grab the other part of this box. I still don't think it would work, but we could try to plug the internal drive externally into another Mac computer and try to go through the XOM setup you know, by booting off of the Leopard CD and going through what the setup guide tells us to do. The problem with that is I don't have an Intel Mac from this era to do that with. The closest thing I've got is my mid-2009 MacBook Pro, but it just straight up refuses to boot up off of this disk at all. I have plenty of PowerPC Macs from around the time the Apple TV first gen was released, but obviously that's not going to help us because we have to use an Intel Mac. So we're just kind of at an impasse here. And like I said, I still don't think that would work because it just seems like the Apple TV is only able to boot up off of a modified copy of Mac OS X or, you know, the original Apple TV software, which itself is a modified copy of Mac OS X. So it kind of sucks that we can't, you know, boot up off of the Leopard disc. That would have been really great if we could. But yeah, I suspect this whole thing has to do with, as I mentioned earlier, the Apple TV's firmware. 
And I'm glad that we did all of this just to confirm because I'm sure there would have been people in the comments saying you should try this. And maybe there will still be people who will say you should try this or that or this or that. I can't think of everything. And like I said, I almost ended off the video and then I thought of this and I bought all these stupid freaking adapters uh, to try and, and get this thing working. But if there are any other suggestions uh, as to how that I could get this working, feel free to leave them down below. But I think it's just not possible at this point because like I mentioned, it's first of all, not even capable of booting off of, you know, a, a Mac OS X Leopard CD or DVD, let alone a Windows installation disc. So, you know, I think we're done with the Apple TV first gen for a little while, but hopefully you guys enjoyed this however long this video is. If you did, be sure to give it a thumbs up, get subscribed, all that good stuff. And as always, thank you so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.